Today we build and paint ICM's American Mechanics from their 1910 series. Coming up next! Hello once again model kit builders and hobby fans. Welcome back to another one of our great model build and paint videos where today we will be looking at these great 1910 American Mechanics from ICM and I'll be building them and painting them today so if you like these kind of videos and you love unboxing videos and stuff don't forget to subscribe to my channel where you can see a whole ton of them in our video library pound that notification bell so that every time I make a new video you're the first one to see it so now without further ado let's go down and check out this great project Today I thought I would build ICM's American Mechanics from 1910. This is ICM model kit number 24009. And these three lovely female mechanics are sitting here working hard on this Model T. Now the Model T is not included in the box, however I do have enough of them upstairs in my collection that I can apply these to later on. So as you may have seen the review video for these before, now we can get into the build video. So to begin with, I'm just going to move this off to the side. I'll show you what type of tools I'll use to assemble these figures. First off, we have a narrow file. Second off, we have a wide file. Uh, we have a number, a hobby knife with a number 11 blade in it. We also have a hobby knife with my favorite, the number 16 blade. This of course is good for getting rid of any mold marks. This one is good for getting rid of seam lines. I also have a pair of side cutters here. Then I've got a sandpaper block. This is a piece of MDF and the sandpaper I have is a sticky back stuff that's used for automotive actually. Then we have a, a tube of testers red tube glue available at any hobby shop including Monster Hobbies of course. And then I also have the testers liquid glue and I can bring this into the store when it's available. So these are the tools that I like to use when I build models. And now let's actually open up that ICM box and take a look at the models that we're going to build. Here we are once again with our box of American Mechanics. And we'll just open the lid and get rid of the box out for a minute. Okay, so like in my review video, this is just a single sheet of figures with a nice set of instructions. You can take a look at the full video in the little thing that pulls up here. Okay, but for today, we're actually going to build these lovely ladies. So, let's just... Remove the plastic. And we can get familiar with the part numbers on the trees. So there they are. <laughs> and we'll just turn this over. So we've got three mechanics that are one standing, one's leaning up against the fenders of the Model T, and the other is leaning over the other side of the Model T. So, it shows you which parts to use per mechanic. So in this one we're using parts 1, 2, and 3, number 5, and number 9. So, let's just find those parts here on a parts tree. And then I'm going to clip them out. After a little further looking at the instruction sheets, I realized that this figure here and this figure here, of course, are the same figure. However, on this side they're showing the numbers that correlate to that side of her body. And on this illustration down here they're showing the opposite parts. So what I've done is I've marked them out on our parts tree here with these little blue X's. And I've discovered that the first female figure is of course all in this one zone here. So that makes things nice and simple. So what we will do here is take our side cutters and I'm going to... Oh, I'm so far away here. 
going to clip carefully against the sprue. So now I can no longer return this to the store if I don't like it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's my Christmas present from my wife. So we can carry on. You could have a bald-headed lady if you want. If you don't want to use the hair. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, it will continue to clip these parts out and then arrange them down here. So here's our parts for our first figure. And as you can see, we've got the head, the left and right hand side of the hair, uh, left and right arms, the body front and back, and the two legs down below. Now since we clipped these off the parts tree, there are a few of the uh, sprue connection points that are in here, which of course we're going to have to get rid of. So of course, one way to do that is just got my number 16 hobby blade and try to just push them off a little bit in with the uh, contour of the actual uh, leg here or the component there's another little one there so what i can do on this one here is you i'll use my uh, wide file and we'll just just sort of push in toward it and around it just to get that proper contour of the rest of the body piece here. Okay, I can see it still has to sand it down a bit or filed down a bit. So that's the sort of thing you want to get nice and round. Now there are some seam lines that run down the leg like this and up into here. Now the way to get rid of those, of course, I'm using my number 16 hobby blade and we'll just scrape along the top. And this is the cleanup process. So we can keep doing that. We can also test fit to see how the pieces will go together before we glue them, such as the legs here and the two pieces of the body. You want to hold them together. You want to look at where any of these things could be interfering with the fit and finish, such as like these cutoff points. If they're rounded or something, you could get a bit of a... Like this isn't too bad, but you could actually get a gap like that. So you want to make sure that you, you know, take your file carefully, because remember, you don't want to go too far away or you'll create the reverse gap. But, you know, get rid of any bits that are over here hanging off, just so that that fit and finish is very precise. So I think what I'll do is clean all these parts up off camera and then come back and possibly show you how to glue them together. So here we have our female figure with all the seam lines removed. And we're almost ready to glue it together, but before we do that, we want to check uh, the fit and finish between these flat surfaces. And once we uh, figure out what that's like, I do believe we're going to have to sand a little bit here with that uh, wooden board, a little MDF. So we want to get these parts that are going to connect together really flat, just so that we get rid of the um, the overhang of any plastic. So by flattening this out with our block, we're getting it as dead flat as this along that edge. <coughs> Pardon me. Whereas if it's not done like this, you get a bit of a, a dome effect. Wait, like a dome effect. So you're only gluing along the little edge here. Whereas this way, you're gluing the whole edge. And that should give us a pretty decent seam line here. Or not a seam line, but a, a flat surface to hook this together, thus making it quite a bit uh, of less of a seam line. So we would do that 
there. Once we glue the legs together, we would also go across the top here to flatten that down. And we're constantly looking to flatten that edge so that everything fits together nice and tightly. So I do believe I've got that together. So what I'll do is just, for example, I'll get out this tester's liquid glue here that we have, and I will glue along here, and then hold the pieces together. So it's actually, what I like to do is just squeeze along the side here and rub it against my finger until the glue actually starts to come out of the little cap. Uh, the more you use this, the more things glue together inside. So there, we've, we've got it there now. So I'll just wipe this off, because you don't want to bring that glue onto the figure. I'll just go around the edge here with our liquid glue. And then I'll put the cap back on it, because it likes to leak out everywhere. So now we want to get these legs together. And check to make sure we've got it all squared up. One way to do this, of course, is take our square block. Just push the bits on against the square block. Oops. Okay, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> but at any rate. You want to get those as square as you can, which I think puts it right there. Okay, so we will glue up these pieces, just like I've shown there, and set them aside and let them all harden up. I'm not too sure on the hair just yet how I want to do that. I might glue her head on bald and then put the hair pieces on. just to get the um, the feel of where they should go instead of trying to glue them on and then find out that one side is getting caught up on the collar of her neck or something like that, you know? So I think I will go along those routes and then start the video again. So now I have a few of the sub-assemblies together on our suffragette female mechanic here. Makes me kind of think of those magnificent men in the flying machines <laughs> with... Uh, all that time period, because this is still around 1910, right? So here we have Yvette, needs to be glued together. I don't know. I was going to try to give some names to these female figures, but of course I'll forget them through the movie. <laughs> uh, because I don't have anything written down to keep track of it. So remember when I said sand everything flat? Well, I noticed that the head connection to the neck is not quite flat, but it will go together nicely without having to file it down. Uh, so here we'll just, if my glue will allow me, hang on, come on out. Hmm. Oh, here we go. We will just put a bead around here. Now I notice that the gaps are not too bad on this model, uh, on these figures, however they could use just a little bit of putty in some spots. Uh, like here, along the side, you can see the uh, seam line in here, but she's wearing a belt that goes all the way across here, and that's the tail of the belt. So a little bit of putty in there, allowed to dry and whatnot, would actually make quite a difference. Now I'm not quite sure how well she'll line up here. Yvette, Yvonne. <laughs> See, I'm already forgetting what I was saying. So you'll notice that as she... Here, let's see. Let's say our block is the ground. So she's bending over like this. And according to our sketch here, she's actually supposed to be going over top of the radiator on the Model T. Now my Model T's, oh, and this is a brass era, 1908 to 19, when was that? 
14 or so uh, Model T with the brass radiator. Oh, I think 1915. In 16 they changed. Anyway, it's, oh yeah, 1915. I'm looking at a Lindbergh model that I've got over there. So, uh, 1915. So 16 is when they changed to the more rounded radiator, which went from <laughs> 1916 uh, to 1927. Anyway, she's standing over top of that brass radiator. So hopefully that will line up with the later Model T's as well. But yeah, you can see it's quite a lean forward type position. So next up, we can glue these arms on. So actually these figures are not going, are uh, going together quite well and quite quickly, I should say. They're going together without any difficulties. So let's see about gluing the arms on. Now keep in mind you don't really want to be gluing this quickly. You want to give time for the glue to dry. And you want to be trying to inspect this from not like two feet away like I am. <laughs> My camera film set up here. I should take a picture of this one day and show you guys how far away I'm leaning in. Okay, so there's her hand there, which is quite close to her chest. And then that's the one hand. There we go. Permit me some glue. So here's the second. Holding the wrench, or the spanner, as they say in England, jolly old England, for all my, uh, all my subscribers over at the UK. There we go. So it's interesting to note that back in this time period, 1910, when most uh, women were supposed to be civil and, you know, had all this sort of pomp and ceremony type of a lifestyle that they had to meet all these expectations that you would find quite a lot of female mechanics and uh, it was quite interesting times <laughs> uh, so now let's see we've got her together this far and we want to put that hair on so i think what should be done here instead of going from the outside let's see because you want a bit of it's just Carefully try to put here glue in toward the back and then along here. And then sort of let's just put a bit in here because we've already got along the back. So one thing that I've noticed, I've done a few statistics on my whoa, there we go. <laughs> I want to make sure you get that right. So I've done a, uh, some analytics and got a, a few statistics recently on... Okay, wait. There we go. There. Now she's looking more like a lady with her hair. <laughs> a lady from 1910. All the way up into, I'd say, the 20s. So there, now we have our female figure. So what I've noticed in my statistics here is that um, I've got a really weird demograph going on this channel right now, as of uh, as of January first, twenty twenty one. And what I've noticed is that <laughs> there's a lot of people that are from ages thirteen to about twenty four that watch this channel. And then there's a demograph that's 24 to 35, and then from 36 to 45, and then from 46 to 50 or 60 something or other. What I've noticed is I've got a lot of demographs that are from 18 to 25, and then absolutely nothing in any of the other demographs until you get to 56 to 60, whatever it is, 70, what the, the limit. So I'm wondering why there's nobody in the middle, and 
it's also mostly men. So if there are women like that are watching this channel, I have a question for you. Did you have any of your grandmothers, or actually even the guys could answer this, any of the grandmothers and great-grandmothers back in the day that were mechanics in this 1910 period? And if you do, let us know in the comments down below. Write some maybe interesting stories of that time period, or of the stories that you know. And uh, yeah, I think that would be kind of neat. So here we have our three female mechanics from 1910, all built up and ready to go on their first uh, mechanic job, fixing the Model T. So as you can see, they do have interesting sort of poses here. She would be standing over uh, the radiator from the front of the car. This lady is lying on the front fender, reaching in on the under the hood there. And then this lady, she is adjusting a headlight, or not a headlight, but a side light on the Model T. So I was looking at the instructions here and just noticing that how the poses look. Oh, that actually looks nice. <laughs> so this is the woman here that's leaning over the hood. Okay, so there's not really much problem with this figure because uh, she could fit into any Model T in the situation. It's all right. Uh, this figure here, though, is specifically designed for that style of Model T with the little side lamp turns sitting up here because she's adjusting them. That's her hand positioning. So our next illustration down here shows the woman that's leaning up against the fender of the Model T. Oops. And as you can see she would be reaching in under the hood with this hand and adjusting one of the head bolts I guess on the uh, engine block. Now I'm going to show you something that's sort of a, a problem if you don't have this era of Model T. Alright, so Laurel and Hardy are having a little bit of engine trouble with their Model T, and they've come to the garage here where we have our female mechanics sitting here pondering over the engine, as well as maybe the foreman or something from the Henry Ford 3-pack kit I built him before. We can take a look at the other Ford figures later. There, of course, is Oliver Hardy and Stan Laurel. All right, so here's sort of a bit of an issue we have with the women trying to work on a more modern Model T. This is 1925 Model T. So from this angle, it doesn't look too bad. But now, if I can move this without knocking anyone over, <laughs> I will. Okay, so we have the one lady here uh, bending over the radiator to take a look. Now, I, I assume that in the 1908 Model T, her hand here would be on the radiator cap. I tried to do the same thing, but then her feet were not touching the ground. So, I just have to sort of lean her there. Now, if you look here, from this frontal angle, this woman is, her hand position is not really doing anything for this car at all. Uh, whereas, if it was a 1908 Model T, there would be a little side lantern here, a square one. So she could be adjusting that lantern. Uh, the figure that sort of is having, I don't know, maybe the most difficult time, sort of like 50% difficult time here, is the one on the fender. Because again, this hand up here is supposed to be, well, I can't see the hand there. Anyway, this hand here is supposed to be resting on the opposite uh, side tail or headlamp or lantern. Sorry. And the other thing I noticed is that it looks like she's sort of bent over into the shape of the fender, but from different angles, she's actually not touching inside here at all. So what I noticed on the 1908 Model T, the 25 has a big curve in here. Whereas the 1908 kind of comes up a little more flat and then goes flat across the top and has a couple little pieces that sort of kick on the over the front wheel there. But, you know, with a little bit of sort of, I don't know, jiggling around, I guess you could kind of get these figures to conform 
a little better to a later Model T. So that means that I'm going to have to buy myself an ICM, whoops, an ICM 1908 Model T, just in order to make this work right. Oh, the foreman fell over. Well, so much for that. Oh, she's starting to move over there. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so next, I guess our next uh, thing to do here, here, let's go this way. Our next thing to do here would be to get these girls painted up, and I'll try to get them in the same coverall color that the foreman here is in, because then that way uh, they will look like they're all from the same garage. The only problem I have here is I can't remember what color I painted these. But all the paint on the figures is the Citadel Games Workshop acrylic base paint. So we'll get into that in a moment. Now just to give you an example of what I'm talking about with those two female mechanics and the fender lines and all the rest of that, this is an old die-cast 120th scale Irwin Toys 1909 Model T Touring, which would be more of what the uh, female mechanics here would be working on. So as you can see, here let's zoom up on this wonderful uh, illustration of that Model T there. I like these models because you kind of get a feel as to what was life was like in 1909. You got the old general store here from the 1800s and still got a horse and buggy in the back. And then you got this <laughs> gentleman guy in his Model T brand new with a brass radiator and all that. Okay, so that one girl that's got her hands in the funny position is holding on to this lamp here, lantern. So this was all like auxiliary lights, because remember this is all oil and everything, right? Oil-powered lanterns. So that one woman, uh, where is she? This one here. Her arms here would be adjusting this lantern, which, you know, I... I don't know how well I can get this in, but you sort of get an idea here like this, right? And the other woman who's lying on the fender. Now, I don't know, does that work? Kind of, according to the illustration. I know it's the wrong side, but um, see, you, you can see how flat this is along the top and then the more gentle curve you've got here going down. Whereas with Laurel and Hardy's model, model T here, oh, let's open it. oh there goes Oliver's, he's bailing out. <laughs> okay, you can see, here, let's this up a little more. You can see the difference. There's such, uh, quite a big curve in here. Whereas here it's more subtle, like up, down, up. Because the metal bending processes would have been a bit different in 1909. In 1925, you could hammer in more of a curve. They had figured out how to do that. Look at the rear fender here. Curves up a little and then goes flat out the back. Well, actually, you can't see that too well. Okay, there. Curves up in front, goes flat out the back. Whereas the Laurel and Hardy one actually does bend up around the wheel. And you may think it's really tight in here, but that's actually how the Model T fenders are. They almost touch that back tire. That's because these only go straight up and down, so it wasn't much of a big deal for that to be in that shape. Just so you know. Anyway, now I've got to figure out how to get <laughs> Oliver back in his seat. Okay, Stan. Stanley, move over. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't so bad. I actually switched these guys' positions, if you remember from earlier videos. Anyway, so getting this all out of the way, that's how those female figures go. Now, in case you're wondering where's the what's in the box on this one, this is 1 20th scale, and currently I'm trying to get through all my 24th and 25th scale models, and then I'll go back into the odd size and do all the what's in the boxes in the future. So this guy could be a couple years down the road. <laughs> anyway, I just brought this box in to show you how it works with those figures. Now for painting these female figures, I do believe I figured out what colors the coveralls were in. And that would be, I'm using Citadel paints here, so that would be Calidor Sky as our base color. Dragonhoff Nightshade as the shade color that will go in into all the small cracks and crevices. 
Teclas blue as layer one and a Lothern blue as the second layer. So here I've got a plate, an old dish that I use for mixing my paints on. I've got a bowl with some water in it. I've got three different brushes here. This one is a soft brush, which we'll use for the base color. And then these ones, oh, we'll also use this one for the shade. These other two are meant for the, we're, we're going to do a dry brush type technique using the Teclas blue and the Lothern blue. So that's our uh, basic stuff we need here for the coveralls. Now we'll begin with the Calador Sky, and according to our instructions, these female figures are actually easy to paint because their coveralls cover all the way up, right up to the neckline, whereas with our foreman here, he's wearing overalls, so I had to go and navigate around the white shirt and all the rest. So these figures are basic. Blue, skin tone, hair color, and the boots. All right, let's get into this. So we will... Let's just move the figures there. I don't know. Base colors, they're a lot thicker from Games Workshop, so really not much need to shake them. However, you do sort of have to cut them in with a bit of water, which we'll do here just to make them flow a little bit. Not too much. Okay, let's start with this mechanic. So I'm just going to Hold her by her hair, I guess. <laughs> okay, so there we go. And yeah, just go crazy with the brush. Try to get into all the crevices. And try to cut around these boots. I know they will get covered over. I don't know, is this the right actual color for these? I can't remember what I painted the guy with and I didn't write any notes down. But at any rate, these girls should have, well, they'll all be the same. So maybe it doesn't matter too much. Okay. I think I'll do one of these on film and then I'll do the other two off camera. Now the nice thing is this is acrylic paint. So it's easy to clean your brush afterwards as well as, uh, what else? <laughs> Easy to clean your brush. Oh, and they dry fast as well. So that's always good. Now normally I would recommend spray bombing these with a flat black uh, or black primer or something like that just to, uh, to cover the plastic and get a slightly better, um, better paint adhesion, I guess. However, uh, it's like really cold out right now. We're in the middle of winter. This is around Christmas, just after early New Year's 2021. And I don't really have a good way to go out and start spray bombing in the cold. So unfortunately, these figures are just going to be painted right on the plastic. However, one thing I did before I started painting here is I took all the figures upstairs and I washed them with mild soapy water just so that if there was any fingerprints or anything, any oils from the plastic molding process and all that, that they would be gone when I did this. So that's something anyway. Okay, see, I've almost got her done. You can see how easy this is. Even from my two feet away, it's not looking too bad. So there we go. It's amazing how many of the uh, songs that I'm playing here in the background music and whatnot are from this period, around 1900, 1910 and all that. And I always thought they were made a little later. You know, like um, Laurel and Hardy in their movies, they would sing, Shine on, shine on harvest moon. But all those movies were made in the 20s, the later 20s, and the early 30s, when uh, the talkies were in. And I always figured that song came out of the 20s. But then when I was doing research, it uh, turns out that that song was written about 1909 or something. 
I can't quite remember. I don't have the I don't have the internet at home. So when I'm quoting these things and it's all wrong, it's because I've got no way to research it until I come to the store on Tuesday morning to reopen the shop that I find out that I made a big mistake. So then I write it down below somewhere so that everyone can see, you know, this is what I really meant to say. But still, that song came around that time. But I think the reason why we think it's later is because it's featured in things later on when they had the technology to record in movies or whatever. There you go. So there's her coveralls now. But yeah, so that's sort of the story of those. So what I'll do is I'll... Oh, missed a spot. What I'll do is I'll let this dry up and I'll paint the other two mechanics down here in the same colors of coveralls. And then we will go into the Drakenhof Nightshade. So here we have the first coat of Kalidor Sky applied to the ladies. And because we had to mix the base with a bit of water, there are sometimes some areas where the paint looks a little thin. And uh, on first inspection we can note that there are a few spots where uh, we missed a little bit with the paint. I do believe yeah, there's a spot here in the back of her leg that sort of thing. So I'm just going to apply a second coat of the base paint and then once that is dry I can do the wash or the shade with the Drakenhof Nightshade paint color. So here's the ladies after a second coating of Calador Sky and as you can see the color now looks a lot more solid. So I think it's time to move in with the Drakenhof Nightshade and what I'll do is, uh, you just, it's basic. It's uh, pretty watery in the consistency. And we'll just grab one of our mechanics here. So basically, this shade paint will start to go into all the little crevices and whatnot to provide the darker shadow in the lower spots. As you can see, that's sort of the technique just to do it. Give everything a nice wash. Doesn't need to be perfect by any means. But we just go right around. So there you can kind of get the idea of what's going on. So I'll just continue where I can see this a lot better and then show you the results on film. We've just finished using the Drakenhof Nightshade and as you can see now their coveralls are all sort of stained with this shade base color. You can see that it's all now down into the folds of the fabric and everything like that. So that's our second paint step. Next up, we want to add in some techless blue. And for this, we're going to take our stiffer brushes that we have here. And uh, these stiff bristles will make it more like a dry brush type effect. So we're going to pop the lid on this, dip our paint in here, wipe it off a little bit on our mixing uh, palette here, and then go over top. And we'll see all of the uh, detail come up with this first layer color from the Games Workshop, which again is our techless blue. So uh, let's just try that. I'm going to do one figure. Uh, maybe I'll do this one here. And then I'll apply this to the other three. All right, I've just shaken up our techless blue and we're just gonna get a little bit on the tip of the brush and just sort of semi-wipe it out. Okay, let's start on the back. Now, with this layer, layer number one, we do want to try to put it everywhere that we can. So, remember though, to keep it dry, because we're not trying to paint the figure. We're just trying to hit all the highlights, like the wrinkles back here on our pant legs, you know. 
So there, you can see that it's starting to, to uh, brighten this up and giving it a little more kind of tonality and depth and that sort of thing. So yeah, we we'll just go across trying to get all the paint out of the bristles of the brush. And of course it's not going to go into the lower spots. So there we go. Now you can see on these pant legs that they are getting a little bit better, a little more defined, and more definition. I'm going to try to pick some more of the paint up off there instead of dipping it in the second time. May or may not work. That well, seems to be. Okay. Try to get the brush into here. And I think that should be all right. Try a little more to there, down around the cuff links. Okay, so now I can move this out of the way. And as you can see, the techless blue has started to bring out the highlights around all those wrinkles and folds on our uniform and everything, or coveralls. So the next step, I might as well just carry on here. The next step is to switch out and get the Lothern blue. Now this is where it gets a little bit different. So I'll just shake this up. You can see my hand going really fast. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to open up the top of this. I'm going to use the same brush. I found that, you know, because this is a dry brush technique, it's not going to bring other paint and mix and make this a weird blue. So I'll just do the same thing. Now, where it gets different here is we don't want to go... Okay. We don't want to go all over the model like we did with the techless blue. With the Lothern blue, now we're going to go from where the sun is going to hit this figure. I kind of hate to do this right on the... Okay. So here's how our figure is against the Model T. So you see how she's standing. Her full back here is getting hit by the sun all the way down, and then the back of her leg here. So, with this techless blue or the Lothern blue, we want to hit... Oops, I got too much paint in there. Huh. Okay, I have to do some paint correction. But you want to hit just down here where the sun is hitting. Oh boy, it's got that one little blob in there that <laughs> you don't want. So yeah, I mean this is all trial and error. I've been doing this a lot with Games Workshop figures, and still every now and again there's a little bit of a paint blob that gets caught in this brush. And it doesn't come out anywhere else until you're gonna do something. <laughs> and then you get a big wrong color streak. Okay, so... Now, if we turn her, I think... I think it's like that. A little bit on the top of her arm down in front. Let's see, how are you standing? Yeah, maybe a bit there. Okay, so that's it. We don't do the front here because all this is in shadow. And the techless blue should be enough, you know, on this side to bring that up. But back here, the Lothern blue really brings out the back. Let's get a little on the neck area. And that basically is how I shade these figures. So now I can go back with my paint and do these other uh, two ladies. And then, uh, yeah, I'll do that and then I'll show you what's next. Now I've got the three ladies all covered with the four different paints. And as you can see here, when we've got her tilted up, the color becomes much lighter on this side, darker on the other side, of course, because that part's in shadow naturally. On this figure, it's all on her back. And same with this figure. 
mostly all on her back. Now, there are some spots, like I said, where I accidentally hit a little too hard with the brush, and so we've got, you know, extra paint that shouldn't be, especially on this arm. So the question is, how do we go back to get it to look like the rest? Well, we've still got the four colors, so one way to do it is get a fine brush like this one. And of course, get in there with the original base color. And very carefully, now I'm very far away, so sort of follow that contour with the paint. And you pretty much have to, if you hit like this, you have to almost repaint, build it from scratch, if you know what I mean. So they were starting to get rid of the big, you know, I hit this too hard with the brush look. Now remember, you're going to go into the deep spots here. I guess I'm not doing this too badly. Okay, so yeah, you go into the deep spots and just sort of correct that out a bit. So now it's looking sort of like what it was, how it's supposed to look. So once the base color dries, uh, you want to clean your brush, of course. So we'll just get that there. Okay, so once... Huh, it's not the best clean job. So once that uh, base paint dries, we're going to take a little Drakenhof Nightshade again. And we'll just carefully go over where I just painted. In the dark areas. So now this should start to... To blend out that base coat and look like we never had the uh, little paint accident there. Okay, so then that'll dry out and it should match the proper like paint color. So I will go and fix the other two ladies up and then we can start looking at the colors needed for the faces and their skin color. Now that we've finished painting the blue coveralls, it's time to add the skin tones. And hey, I, I got some names for these ladies. See if you uh, can relate to this. We've got Mary, Laura, and Carrie. Now, if you know where those names are from, write it down in the comments down below. But anyway, uh, there's Mary, Laura, and Carrie. So they're all sisters. So we're going to use these colors for the skin tone, and we're going to apply it the exact same way we did with the blue coveralls. So first off is Bugman's Glow, and then a shade of Reichland Flesh. So this will go over all the skin. So luckily we only have to deal with faces and hands with these figures. So um, Bugman's Glow first, and then the Reichland Flesh shade for getting into the cracks and crevices. Then Cadian Flesh Tone to bring it up one level. And then the Kislev Flesh for the um, sunlight kind of highlight bits. Now I'm not going to actually paint these on film because I know this video is already cooking into like 45 minutes or more. Or even past that point. And I'm sure you don't want this to be like a, a three hour epic long movie longer than Star Wars while we paint three figures. So I'm going to do all the colors like this from here out. So I'll list the four across the top and you know for like the hair color and whatever. And then I'll paint it all off camera and then come back and just quickly show you what it looks like with them painted. So that's what we'll do right now. So begin! <laughs> I've just finished applying the skin tones to uh, Mary, Laura, and Carrie here. And as you can see they now actually look a lot better. They're not uh, got the blue paint from the coveralls in their face or anything. So the next step is to do their hair. And I don't want these ladies to all look totally identical. So one of them, of course, will be blonde. One of them will be a redhead and the other will be brunette. So I'm going to do these one at a time. I'll do the same thing. I'll just lay out the paints above 
and whoever I choose gets that hair color. Carrie is going to end up with the red hair, so in order to paint that color, we have Jokero Orange as our base, Reichland Flesh Shade as the shade color, Troll Slayer Orange as layer one, and Fire Dragon Bright as layer two. One thing I should have mentioned is I've switched my brushes. I'm using the more narrow brush and the smaller version of this brush, which I think I... Oh, I dropped it on the floor. <laughs> anyway, so that's how I'm getting into the face and everything. And one other thing, remember that the eyebrows are also going to be painted in these colors too. For Laura, I'm going to give her hair a sandy blonde color. So I'm going to use Zandri Dust as a base, Agrath Earthshade as our shade, uh, Talaran Sand as layer one, and then Screaming Skull as the final layer. I might even do a layer of white scar paint. I'm not sure yet, but this will be Laura's hair color here. Now for Mary here, I've decided to give her black hair, jet black hair, instead of uh, a brunette, because I want to make sure that the boots are going to be all brown. So I don't want someone's hair to be the same color as the boots. <laughs> so I've decided to go with Abaddon Black. Now there's supposed to be a bottle of Nuln Oil here, but I don't have any left. Uh, that would be our shade. Eschen Grey for layer one and Dawnstone for layer two. But I found that you can, with the Abaddon Black, you can almost get away without the Nuln Oil. So that's how I'm going to do Mary here. Here's how the hair looks on Mary, Laura, and Carrie after we've used all those paint colors. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of light refraction and whatnot going on in here. The different look. There's the blonde. It does look a little darker and dirtier in real life than on film here, but that's not too bad. And then our redhead here. So again, you can see, and the way I've painted the lighter colors, of course, again, is toward where the sun is falling down, darker in the front for the shadows. So next up, I mean, these are now starting to look more like women instead of just weird plastic things. Uh, mannequins, I guess. So next up, we would have to paint the white and the color in the eyes and finalize it with the boots and any of the tools that they're holding. Now for the eyes, we're going to start with white scar and just put it in the eye sockets, I guess. And then for Mary here, we're going to use Dryad Bark, a brown color. For Laura, we're going to use the, the Kelador Sky. And for Carrie, we're going to use War Boss Green. So I've got this like really narrow edited brush here. So I'll just dip it in the white and I'll go doot doot and then clean it off. Take this one and kind of go dot dot. You know what I mean? Sort of cat eye style. So I'm going to do that and then I'll show you the results. Here we have the ladies with their eyes painted in. And now they look more like humans than just mannequins. So here we have Mary and we have Laura and we have Carrie. So Mary has brown eyes. Uh, Laura has blue and Carrie has green. Just to speed this video up a little bit, I've got two sets of paints going on this time. We have Celestia Gray, Ulithin Gray, and then White Scar. And I'm going to use this sort of between their necks here because there's a little bit of a shirt sort of thing showing through. Sort of a undergarment for the overalls. And then down here, this is going to be the color of their shoes. So we have Rhinox Hide, Agrath Earthshade for the wash, Doombowl Brown for the first layer, and then Tuscor Fur for the final layer. And I always use these colors here for uh, leather. So we're going to do that. And then the last thing to do would be painting the tools with our metal colors from Citadel. And there really isn't, uh, you know, any other steel colors for this. So anyway, I'll get to that in a minute, but what I'll do is I'll paint all these colors on and then show you the results. Here we have our lovely ladies again, and this time they have their boots painted, 
as well as the little ascots here. I guess that's what they're supposed to be. And as you can see, if we turn uh, Mary over this way a little bit, you can see the boots lighten up here. And then for uh, <laughs> Laura, I've got the lighter bits on the top here as the sun would come down and hit it. Also put a little bit of white up here on the ascot where uh, the sun would most likely hit it. And then for Carrie here, same thing with the boots. Oops, my hand's in the way. And same with the ascot. Now, the last thing we have to do is paint these branches and tools that the girls are holding. Now, since Carrie doesn't have any, we can just move her off to the side. So our colors are going to be lead belcher, which is like a steel color. There would be Nuln Oil in here, but I don't have it. Could also substitute Agrath Earthshade in there. Then we've got Iron Breaker. And last but not least, Rune Fang Steel as our third layer paint. And this will really brighten it up on the tops. So I will paint these two tools using these colors and then show you the results. Here's our three ladies all finished up, ready to go working on the Model T. So let's arrange that and see how it looks. And here we are with the mechanics and Henry Ford and his partner looking over Laurel and Hardy's Model T. Now unfortunately, I don't have my tripod here at the moment, so that's why it's a little wobbly there. So what I'll do is I'll just take some pictures of this and then we'll wrap up the video. Well, I hope you enjoyed my build and paint of these great figures. And I'm kind of sorry for uh, having this video go for so long. I don't have that high speed feature like you see in other people's YouTube videos where, you know, they could just go and then they talk over the top and they're like, yes, I'm painting this thing now and here's where I'm putting on the thing and the, the image is going me. I don't have that feature. So I actually have to do it all in real time and that's why this video ended up being an hour long. However, I hope you all learned, you know, how to paint these figures using the Citadel paints. And what I'm thinking is maybe in the future, if I do something like this video again, a build, I might just do like one phase, the next phase, the next phase. So like in a model car, I might do uh, build and paint the engine. And then next week, build and paint the interior, you know, something like that. So it's progressive instead of trying to do it all in one video and end up with like a 18 hour long movie, you know, the only thing we want to be like 10 hours long on YouTube is like a playlist for music. But anyway, so we will see you next time.